take a hymnal, page 505. Love lifted me as we stand. Amen. And somebody said, well, what'd you get lifted from? Well, we get lifted from our sin, but I'll tell you what I got lifted from. I got lifted from religions, what I did, and my own morality because my sin was going to take me to hell. My religion was going to take me to hell, and my own morality was going to take me to hell. You say, well, well what, what'd you get lifted for? I got lifted out of the miry clay, out of the deep pit, and set my feet on a solid rock. Now listen to me close now. And I got wonderfully saved by the grace of God. That's what we're talking about, all right? That's what we're singing about. My, how the Lord's blessed Mountain View this morning. And I, I want to quickly go over real quick. Uh, our brother's going to pray. But uh, I want to welcome Christian right here. I'm so thrilled that you are here. And Josh, young man right here with us, appreciate you being here. Uh, this morning uh, at the house of the Lord and then over on my far left that's Noah but that's Noah's brother and I should have got your first name but forgive me but uh, we're glad you're here all right thank you for being here and then Mr. Uh, Kevin Cash right back here with his daughter uh, Leah Cash five years old we appreciate them being here and then we got Bruce Cole and Melissa Youngblood I don't know who invited them but I love the note I love the note it said, some couple that attends here, we met them at the Bantam Chef. Somebody give me an amen for the Bantam Chef. That's <laughs> got some good food, amen. I mean, that and the Red Rooster's got some good food. But they met them there and invited them. And thank you all. To have to have, thank you for inviting them, all right? So the Lord's blessings with visitors uh, throughout the congregation. We'll sing another song in a moment and make them all feel welcome, all right? Brother Rick Ivester, please ask God to help us today. Please, sir. Let's pray. Father, we sure do thank you for the love of God. Amen. Love lifted me. Nobody ever loved me like Jesus. I thank God for that truth. Nobody ever died for me before. Nobody ever suffered for me before like Jesus. And I just want to thank you today for the Son of God, the Lamb of God that taketh away the, son of the, uh, the sins of the world. Lord, I love you today, and I thank you for loving me. Lord, I want to thank you for the church, but I want to thank you for this church. Lord, I, I'm so thankful, Lord, that you brought me this way, me and my wife this way. Lord, what a place where we can come and get taught the Bible truths in Sunday school. I thank you for Sunday school. Thank you for my Sunday school teacher that's faithful, Lord, to study the scriptures. Thank you, dear God, for uh, a place where we can come and hear the word of God preached. Thank you for a good pastor. Lord, I know that he prays over the word. I know that he studies the word, and I thank you for that. Lord, I pray, dear God, for those in the building this morning that might be lost and undone without Jesus. There might be a soul in here today that don't know Jesus as Savior. And what a tragedy that would be to leave here today and not know Jesus. Lord, I pray, dear God, for this congregation. I pray, Lord, for the choir. Pray for Brother uh, Kyle as he leads the choir, Brother Cam and the youth choir. I pray, God, every song that we sing today, may we lift up the name of Jesus. 
Lord, I pray and ask you, Lord, to come and meet with us today. Lord, there may be some hurting hearts, some discouraged souls in the building today. God, please, Lord, come and meet with us. Fill this place with your presence. Fill my pastor with the Holy Ghost. Help him to preach, Lord. I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, have your will and way today with our hearts. Have your will and way with our minds. Lord, wouldn't it be great if we could just put the world aside for a couple of hours and just come in here and lift up the name of Jesus. We love you. Thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Excuse me. You may be seated all over the building, and we want to also welcome a uh, precious lady over here to my far left. Uh, I'll get your name later. If somebody will, Brother John, if y'all could get a visitor's card to the lady on the far left. All right, Brother John. Hope you can hear me in the front foyer. But uh, far left behind Brother Paul Cobworth over here. Appreciate all of our visitors. We make much of them. We're delighted they're here. They're the honored guests. Listen, Mountain View, they're the honored guests here at Mountain View Baptist Church, and we greatly appreciate them coming to the house of the Lord today. We'll be back tonight at 6 p.m. We'd love to have you. And then 7.30 p.m. on a Wednesday night. We also would be honored to have you on at 7.30 tonight. And uh, we just found out, if you'll look in your bulletin, I hope you have one. If you do not have one, the ushers will have one. We just wanted to add another prayer request, and that was Miss Dwan Thomas. Just found out a little while ago that uh, she has contracted the virus. She's a asymptomatic. She didn't get it here at church. She got it, I believe they heard Brother Perry say, uh, uh, contracted it at the hospital doing some therapy. So uh, Miss Dwan Thomas is in quarantine for about nine days. And again, she did not get it from the church. So uh, either way, it's just uh, pray for her and all these others on the prayer list, and we'll greatly appreciate that. Remember the Fall Festival, October 27th. Remember Pastor Appreciation Dinner Sunday, October 25th. And then if you'll look at the bulletin, Bethany has all these other dates on the right-hand column. Thank you, Bethany, and all the class get-togethers and things that are coming up, school singing, so, so play information is down there about a Christmas play December 13th. Everything you need to know is in this bulletin. And if you'll get one, that will be greatly appreciated. The ushers are coming in right now. We're going to get the regular tithe and the regular offering. I want you to give us unto the Lord. You folks in the balcony, we're glad you're here. Appreciate you being here as well in the sanctuary this morning. Choir's going to sing another song for us. And uh, please make sure, Brother John, all the visitors have visitor's cards, if you will. You got that? All right. God bless you. And everybody needs a bulletin, you get a bulletin out. All right. Thank you. Go right ahead. those drums we finally moved the drums over to the right hand corner and hit them all hit all of them and so uh, I'm glad they're there this is my son-in-law for you that don't know my son-in-law he married our younger daughter Bethany he works at the Spartanburg Regional Hospital as a nurse anesthetist and so uh, this is the individual that many times is responsible for uh, seeing you take your teeth out <laughs> I'm, just kidding. I'm, just kidding. I'm just kidding all right don't don't do that don't do that but uh, he helps put you to sleep so my point is, you got to be nice, you know, because he's got some of that, uh, some of that uh, toporol or whatever you call that. What's that white stuff? 
Yeah, Michael Jackson drug, yeah. yeah. We don't want to know that Michael Jackson drug, all right? Unless we need it, all right? But uh, the moral of the story is be nice when you go to the hospital. He might walk in with a needle about that long and he's putting you under. And so uh, if you're not nice, he might put you under for an extra few hours just so you might hush that blabbing mouth. But anyway, just be nice. Just be nice, all right? Just thought I'd be a little humorous, all right? Pray for us, Michael Jackson. Lord, we thank you for the day. Thank you for the opportunity to be back in your house today. I pray that you would bless the service. Lord, we come to worship you today. I pray that you would bless the offering, bless the giver. I pray that you would help the singers, help the choir, everything that goes on. I pray that it would bring honor and glory to you. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Sing it out. Sing it out. Thank you, brother. 57.
to take a hymnal, page number 506. I will sing of my Redeemer, the first and the last, as the choir comes down on the last. 506, everybody help us sing. Welcome our visitors. We have visitors all over the building, all right? Please welcome these folks in the building. Got a lady named Angie that just moved here from, well, moved here to Calpins, all right? Bastidos, Miss Angie Bastidos, right here on my left. Let's make her feel welcome, everybody. Make her feel welcome. Mr. Bruce Martin on the left. Need to make Mr. Bruce Martin feel welcome on the left side, all right? On the left. All these visitors everywhere in the building. singers are getting ready. The first group will be a bluegrass gospel Christian group. This is a family, and uh, they're the Owens family, and then we'll have a ladies trio, but uh, let me recognize, uh, man, I got folks everywhere here, and I want to take a moment. We got, we, we, we recognize most of them, but Miss Angie Bastidos right here on my left lives on Battleground Road. God bless you. We're so glad you're here. Uh, passes by often, now in Calpin, and then uh, Mr. Bruce Martin, they've been coming, they're from Hendersonville, Long Drive. Appreciate that. And then our dear folks from way up in Newberry, uh, South Carolina. Now, now you got son-in-law and a whole crowd up there. We're glad you're here. And uh, Patrick, God bless you. Mandy, glad you're here. Glad everybody's here, all right? Let's worship together. Uh, this may not be your flavor. This may not be your flavor, but this is a good flavor, amen? These guys are good folks. They're good folks. They love the Lord. And let their music be a blessing to you this morning, all right?
All that ability, Brother Randy, be able to play all those instruments. Praise the Lord for it. All right, this is one of our ladies' trios, and then we're going to get right into the Word in just a little bit. The fall festival uh, happens. We rotate from the ball field, uh, a big, big cookout ball field one year, and then we rotate to the skating rink down here the next year and rent it exclusively for the church, and that's what we've done this year again. And so that will be, I think, October 27th. But uh, we're asking the folks, the ladies especially, to bring candy. You can put it in that uh, office right over here, and that way we get a gang of ladies to get some candy bags for the children. And, of course, I've known some adults get some candy bags too, so they enjoy it as well. All right, this is one of our ladies' trios. Amen to that. Song's been around a long time, but it never gets old. Amen. I'd like for everybody in this sanctuary, please, today to take your Bible and go to 1 Kings chapter number 20, okay? That's in the Old Testament. If you're carrying an old Schofield Bible, it's page 416. 1 Kings chapter number 20, historical passages of Scripture with a great Bible truth for you and I, okay? That's what we have today. Man, I I'm excited and thrilled and blessed with these visitors being here. Really, really an answer to prayer. Brother Wofford, that's an answer to prayer. That the visitors are here. Some family members of folks that are here today. I want you to know you bless our heart. You bless our heart by being here in God's house. We want you to come back. We hope we've been friendly. Um, we want you to come to the fall festival if you want to. That's on a Thursday night. We'd love to have you. Uh, anything going on around here, all you visitors, you're more than welcome to participate, all right? 
1 Kings chapter number 20, before I preach, I want to say how essential it is. Now listen close. How essential it is in these days of distorted views of the Godhead to have a biblical understanding of the very nature of God. I found out, Brother Loving, that if a person doesn't believe right, they won't behave right. I'm talking about our theology. I'm talking about our theology. And our theology is the doctrine of God, what the Scriptures say about God. And that's what we're going to be dealing with today. 1 Kings chapter 20, look if you will, in verse number 22. And the prophet came to the king of Israel, and that was Ahab, and said unto him, Go, strengthen thyself, and mark, and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year, the king of Syria will come up against thee. He had already come up in the earlier part of the chapter to battle against Ahab and Israel. And the Bible said he's coming again at the return of the year. And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we'll, we will be stronger than they. And do this thing, take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains into rooms, and number thee an army like the army that thou hast lost, horse for her horse, and chariot for chariot, and we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. This is the Syrians talking. And he hearkened to their voice and did so. And it came to pass at the return of the year that Ben Hadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. The children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids, but the Syrians filled the country. Now here's my verse. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, the Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude in thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And they pitched one over against the other seven days. So it was that in the seventh day the battle was joined, and the children of Israel slew of the Syrians and 100,000 footmen in one day. That's a terrible loss. 100,000 soldiers dying in one day. Watch what happened. Divine intervention here. Verse 30. But the rest fled to Aphek, into the city. And there, was, and there a wall fell upon 20 and 7,000 of the, of the men that were left. And Ben-Hadad fled and came into the city into an, an inner chamber. Let's, have, let's pray, all right? Brother Landon, stand up and ask God to help us to preach today, please, sir. Yes, yes. God grant it. Amen. I would like to direct this congregation's good attention to verse number 28. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. The Syrians were wrong. Say amen. The Syrians' theology was wrong. I want to use that verse, a great, great verse, and I want to preach this morning on the God of the mountains is also the God of the valleys. Write that down. The God of the mountains is also the God of the valleys. It is well for us to know and to understand that God's people, this is Israel and Ahab, and we're not going to get into the fact that he was a bad king, but yet he had an enemy and that was Ben-Hadad and the Syrians. And they were going to return 
at the end of the year. And they did exactly that. In verse number 22, Dr. Love, he says to Ahab, I want you to strengthen yourself. I want you to mark. And I want you to see what thou doest. Josh, there's three things there. He said, number one, Ahab, you need to be empowered. Number two, you need to be prepared. Uh, number three, you need a plan, all right? You need to be empowered. You need to be prepared. And you need a plan. And can I tell you, when we face our enemies, and your enemy is not the people sitting on the church pew with you, but our enemy is the world, our enemy is the flesh, and our enemy is the devil. We need empowered. We need to be prepared. And thank God we do need a plan. Amen. Now, before the fighting ensued, there came a man of God. In verse number 29, I'm trying to relate the history here. In verse number 29, before the battle was fought, before the battle, the actual fighting took place, the man of God came to Ahab and said, I got a message for you, and I have some theology that I want to share with you. And the theology, Brother Randy, is that the Syrians have said, not the Israelites, and not even Ahab, not the king of Israel, but the Syrians have said in verse number 29 that the Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Could I tell you something? That wasn't accurate. This was the respect of the man of God. This was the message of the man of God. And Christian, he worded it exactly as any man of God should have worded it. But that's not what they believe. And that's also not what they said. How do you know? Take your Bible and look at verse number 23. Look in verse number 23. It's unbelievable here. And the servants of the king of Syria, of Ben-Hadad, said unto him, watch this, their gods, little g, are gods of the hills. Therefore, they were stronger than we. Do you see the connection there? Do you see the contrast there? Do you see the literally the polar opposites there? Brother Nathan, there is a little g, God, and that's what they believed in. They were polytheists, all right? A polytheism says that we believe in a multitude of God, a multiplication of of God, but that's not what the man of God said, and that's not what Israel believed. Israel believed that there is none other beside God, and that God is God, and there is none other. They also believe that the Lord our God is one Lord. But you look at verse 23, Brother Derry, and they said that their gods, plural, are gods of the hills. You see how they paraphrased it? Must have been the NIV. Somebody needs to help me right there. I said it must have been the NIV. That's not accurate. That's not scriptural. That's not biblical. And could I tell you something? The man of God had a message for the serious. And you know what the message is? Number one, it was the unity of God. The unity of God. Could I tell you something today, beloved? God is one. Amen. God is one. They did not believe. They did not believe, Brother Phil, back in the unity of God as is taught in Exodus chapter 20 and verse number 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me as is taught in Deuteronomy 6, 4. The Lord our God is one Lord as is taught. Take your Bible and go to Deuteronomy 10. Let me show you a verse, all right? Go to Deuteronomy chapter 10, everybody. Follow with me. We'll get as far as we can with this this morning, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 10. I want to show you a verse in the Old Testament that corresponds with my message. Chapter 10 and verse number 17. For the Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. Look at the first part. For the Lord your God is God of God. What is he saying there? All those, 
all those Syrian gods, all those polytheistic gods, they are little g. They're made out of stone. Can I get a Bible reader? They're made out of a stock of wood. They're made out of, uh, of some, kind of, some kind of material, Brother David. Uh, or maybe it's the sun or the moon or the fertility or the God of the Nile River. In other words, it, uh, uh, the, 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 the hostile tribes that surrounded the people of Israel, they did not worship the Lord God of Israel. They did not know the reality of the Lord God of Israel. They worshiped gods of sticks and gods of stones and gods of constellation and gods of fertility and gods of fire and gods of water and gods of, of all kinds of, of all kinds of abominable, I said abominable practices. Uh, but you and I that are Christian, you and I that are belong to the Lord, you and I that are saved by the grace of God, uh, because of biblical revelation, because of biblical revelation, you know what we say? The Lord our God is one God. Amen. Somebody help me right there. One Lord, one God. By the way, now hold on, everybody. I'm talking about the man of God had a message for the Syrians, and he wanted them to know that your theology isn't right. Your theology is not right. Here's the right theology, that there is the unity of the Godhead, the unity of the Godhead. But that unity of the Godhead, now hold on, exists as a trinity. Come on, help me right there. You say, where are you preaching from? The King James Bible, the Word of God. This is what I found out. People don't know God. I found out they think they know something about God but you can't bypass the revelation of the Word of God. I know anything about the God of heaven. The God of heaven is one. Somebody say amen. The God of heaven is called the unity. It's called the unity of the Godhead. Hold on, everybody. I've got a lot to cover, but the unity of the Godhead exists as a trinity. A trinity, by that I mean there is God the Father. Could I get an amen? amen? There is God the Son, and there is God the Holy Spirit. Any departure, I'm going to give you some doctrine right here. Any departure from this biblical revelation is considered a departure from scriptural truth. The doctrine of the Trinity is a central fact of the Christian faith. It is also, it is also beyond human comprehension. It is best defined, it is best defined as holding that while God is one, he exists in three persons. These three persons are equal, they have the same attributes, and they are equally worthy of adoration, of our worship, and our faith. Hold on to your pew now. Yet the doctrine of the unity of the Godhead makes it clear that they are not three separate gods. Say amen. I need to say something right here. I mean, I need to say something right here. The doctrine of the Trinity does not do away with the unity of the Godhead. I said it does not do away with the unity of the Godhead. In other words, there's not, no, I believe this, there's not three separate gods. God is God, Jesus is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, but they're not three separate gods. You say, I can't comprehend that. You look up here, neither can I. I can't describe that, neither can I. I can't unrattle that, neither can I. Uh, but I'll tell you something, oh, happy day, oh, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away, and the Holy Spirit came by the 
prepared to live on the inside. And when he came to live on the inside, I got the author of the book on the inside. And the author of the book on the inside says, what that man said is accurate. What that man said is biblical. That is according out of what thus saith the Lord. That's not according to Mountain View Baptist Church. That's not according to Mountain View Christian Academy. That's not according to the Baptist denomination. I said that's not according out of the Baptist denomination, but the clear, undiluted, unadulterated truth of the Word of God is uh, that there is such a thing as the unity of the Godhead, but the unity of the Godhead is manifest in a trinity. Amen. Am I preaching it right? Am I preaching it right? I want you young people to understand something. I'm going to slow down. He exists in three persons. He exists in three persons. These persons are equal. They have the same attributes. And they are equally worthy of our adoration, our worship, and our faith. Yet the doctrine of the unity of the Godhead makes it clear that they are, and I've never said this here, that they are not three separate gods. They're not. Like we would have three separate human beings like Peter, James, and John. Here it is. Only one Jehovah. Only one God. Deuteronomy 6, 4. The Lord our God is one Lord. One God, Miss Jimenez, one God, one Lord, all right? One Jehovah manifesting himself to us in a threefold way as himself, God the Father, in his Son and through the Holy Spirit. Could I help us today with our theology when Jesus was on earth? When Jesus was on earth, it was God in the flesh. When the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, it was God on the day of Pentecost. I go further and say, Brother Galloway, since the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of me, and thank God he does, and he lives on the inside of you, guess who lives on the inside of me? I have God. God on the inside. Oh my, what treasure, what treasure in earthen vessels. And I am a habitation, there it is. I am a habitation of God through the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2 in verse number 23, look at it. I'll never finish this message this morning, but in verse number 23, look at it. Brother Landy, they said their gods, little gods, are gods of the hills. They're not Polytheists, they are, they are not polytheism. They believe in the unity of the Godhead. And I believe in the unity of the Godhead. And so therefore I say to you that the God on the mountain is the same God that's in the valley. I said the God on the mountain is the same God that's in the valley. He doesn't change. He doesn't change. Amen. That'll make a Presbyterian say amen. Stay with me, all right? In the nature, and I did a lot of reading about all this, in the nature of the uniqueness of the Godhead, there is no illustration nor parallel in human experience. Stay with me, okay? Thus, this doctrine of the unity of the Godhead manifested as a trinity. This doctrine should be accepted by faith on the basis of scriptural revelation even if it is beyond human comprehension and human definition. And I want to flat footed tell you it's beyond my human comprehension and it's behind be beyond it, Brother Trey. It's beyond my way of being able to define and explain things. But listen, folks, the just shall live by faith. I believe today, I believe in the unity of the Godhead. 
I believe that unity of the Godhead is manifest in a triune God. A trinity, not three gods, not three gods. No, sir, not three gods. One God, somebody help me. Am I making sense? Manifest in three different modes, three different, three different representations. And so when the man of God, Brother Stoltz, came to Ahab, now I love this. Brother Galloway, he said, he sort of said like, you know those Syrians, here's what they say. They say that the God on the hills is not the God in the valleys. He said, since their theology is wrong and since their perception of God is all wrong, I'm going to give you a great, uh, can you imagine this? Ahab, the wicked king Ahab. I'm going to give you a great victory. Now watch what he said, Brother Perry, in verse number 28, and I love it. I love it. Look at verse 28. Therefore, the latter part of the verse, everybody, I love this. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude, the serious, into thine hand. And watch, this, watch the pronoun here. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. He said, I've got a message. And by the way, a man of God ought to have a message. A man of God ought to have a message. Brother Good, the man of God had a message for the serious, but he also had a message for Ahab. He said, Ahab, I want you to know something. I'm going to give you a deliverance. I'm going to give you a victory. I'm going to give you a conquest. There's going to be a conflict. There's going to be war. There's going to be warfare. And how about, Brother Kyle, 100,000 Syrian soldiers perished that day on the battlefield. 27,000 and more ran to the city. And it just so happened. It just so happened that they leaned up against a wall and the wall, look at the next verse, came tumbling down. We're not talking about Humpty Dumpty. We're not talking about my fairy tale or Aesop's fables. They just so happened to lean against the wall and the Bible, the Bible said a wall came and killed 27 or 37,000 in the city of Aphek. And you know what all that happened for? I'll tell you why it all happened for. Because God wanted to tell Ahab and God wanted to tell Israel that I am the Lord, I am God, and beside me there is none else. And I can do things that nobody else can do. I'm the God of the supernatural. I'm the God of omnipotence. I'm the God of omniscience. I'm the God of ability. I'm the God of sovereignty. I'm the God of unity. I'm the God of immutability. I'm the God I can wreak havoc on the enemy. And when I do, I'm doing it so that you might know that I am the Lord God. I want to say to this church today, I want to say to this church, and I want you to believe it, and I want you to accept it, and I want you to grasp it, the God on the mountain, hey, he's still the same God that's in the valley. Amen. I believe the Syrians need to know that. I believe the world needs to know that. Would you let me get one more? Would you let me get one more? Maybe two? The Syrians' perception of God was they did not believe. I've never preached this. First time I've ever preached this. I'm having a good time. I hope you are. They did not believe in the unity of God. That's proof of verse 23 and verse 28. They did not believe in the unity of God. I'll tell you what else they didn't believe in. They didn't believe in the sovereignty of God. Jada, they didn't believe in the sovereignty of God. He said, what the devil's, what, what is that kind of word? What, what, I don't ever hear that. What does it mean that God is sovereign? Here's what it means. There is none to control him. God, I'm giving you theology. I'm giving you doctrine. God is supreme over all. I love this. Oh, man. He yields to no other power, to no other authority, or glory, and he is not subject to anyone absolutely greater than himself. I said, God is not subject to anyone absolutely greater than himself. Hey, the songwriter had it right, higher than the highest, greater than the greatest. God is 
sovereign. He represents perfection to an infinite degree in every aspect of his being. I'm giving you theology. He can never be surprised. He's sovereign. He's absolutely in control. Don't lose me. Don't lose me. He's absolutely in control. And look up here. He's absolutely on his throne. He hasn't abnegated his throne. God, and by the way, in 2020, it may appear so, but guess where God is? He's still on his throne. He's still on his throne. He's in control. Watch this. He cannot be surprised. He cannot be defeated. And he cannot be uncertain. He rules and reigns supreme and is presiding over the affairs of men. You see, these Syrians, these Syrians, their theology was all messed up. In other words, basically, Derek, they didn't have no theology. They denied the unity of the Godhead, and they also denied the sovereignty of God. See, if they even thought they knew him, the fact, Brother Mike Lee Jr., that a God on the mountain couldn't be the same God in the valley, that denies his sovereignty. That denies his sovereignty. Stay with me, okay? Not only did they deny the unity of the Godhead with that phrase, they denied the immutability of the God. Uh, 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 they, they, denied, they denied the sovereignty of God, but they denied the immutability of God. What is the immutability of God? It means that he is changeless. He is changeless. Stay with me. God's nature is absolutely, I love this myself. God's nature, I'm preaching the Bible, is absolutely unchangeable. God remains forever the same. It is not possible that he should possess one attribute at one time that he does not possess at another time. Nor can there be any change in him as deity for the better or for the worse. He is without beginning and he is without end. He is the self-existent great I am. God in his nature and in his character is absolutely without change. He is unalterably fixed. He endures forever. By them to blasphemously and to foolishly assert that the God of the mountain is not the God of the valley, they are denying God's unity. They are denying God's sovereignty. And yes, they are denying God's immutability. Listen, I love it. Don't you love it? He does not change. So if he, here's what I'm trying to tell you. If he helped them win on the mountain, thank God he can help them win in the valley. I'm not being humorous nor smart, but if he kicked their tail on the mountain, he can kick their tail in the valley. I want to say this to this church today. The God of the mountain is most assuredly the God of the valley. Man. Where's your faith? Where's my faith? Where's my trust? Where's my confidence? Where's my belief? If you accept biblical revelation, if you accept biblical revelation, and as far as I know, Brother David and Lord say, that's the only kind of revelation God has given to this mankind is biblical revelation then you have to accept and you have to believe, number one, in the unity of God. Number two, you have to believe, Mr. Menez, in the sovereignty of God. And number three, you have to believe in the immutability of God. He does not change. He said in Malachi, I am the Lord, I change not. In James, he says, there is no variableness, no shadow of turning. God remains the same. The Syrians had no theology, and the man of God came and said, I've got a message, and the message is a message of the right, the proper, and the biblical theology. And by the way, the Israelites accepted every bit of this. Amen. Number four, and I'm finished. They did not believe. They did not believe in the unity of the Godhead. They did not believe and the sovereignty of God. Brother Andy, they did not believe in the immutability of God. 
And I have one more, and I'll be finished, and you'll like this one. Listen to this. When they said, watch this, this is so good. This is so good. When they said that their gods are just the gods of the hills, let's take them to the plain the valleys, and we'll beat them down there. And then the man of God came and said, because they said that he's just God of the mountain, not God of the valley, I'll give you victory. You know what they were denying? Watch this, John. You know what they were denying? They were denying his omnipresence. It's almost funny. It's almost facetious. It's almost like, what? You think that the God on the mountain is not located down in the valley? Friend, I want to tell you, he's God on Sunday. He's God on Monday. He's God on Tuesday. And, and our God, listen, not only is our God uh, 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 uni unified, the unity of the Godhead, not only is our God sovereign, not only is our God immutable, he's immutable, but I want to tell you, our God is omnipresent. 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 Listen to this. God is everywhere present. The mountains and the valleys. This attribute is closely connected with his omniscience, means all knowledge, and his omnipotence, which means all power. For if God is everywhere present, he is also everywhere active and possesses full knowledge, I love this, of all that transpires in every place. God is everywhere and in every place. His, you've read this. His center is everywhere. His circumference is nowhere. <laughs> his center is everywhere. His circumference is nowhere. But this presence is a spiritual presence and not a material presence. Yet, yet it is a real presence. A real presence. God is unrestricted by any bounds. I'm not boring you, am I? God is unrestricted by any bounds. And in the unsearchable grandeur of his nature, he fills and transcends duration and space. All space contains or even can contain or is pervaded by his august presence. He fills all space. God the creator and sustainer of all things is present universally and simultaneously in every part of his wide domain and is also able to put forth his entire power in every place at one and the same time. I say in closing, he is present everywhere. He is present everywhere all the time. David said in Psalm, was it 138, 139, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I ascend to the height, behold, thou art there. David said, you beheld my secret parts when my members were yet unformed. That's why we don't believe in abortion. Say amen. amen. On and on and on we could preach. Listen, friend, they denied, they denied the unity of the Godhead. They denied the sovereignty of God. They denied the immutability of God. They denied the omnipresence of God. I close by saying to this audience today that the God on the mountain that we shout about, we sing about, we know, we pray, we rejoice, we celebrate, we share, we communicate, we pray to the God on the mountain is the absolute same God in the valley. Hallelujah goes right there. Hallelujah to the Lamb. The God on the mountain is truly the God of the valley. In all of his unity, in all of his sovereignty, in all of his immutability, and in all of his omnipresence. I'm glad I know him. I'm glad I've had. I'm glad I've been blessed. I've been privileged with some biblical revelation. Say, so, well, you wouldn't know all that if it wasn't for the Bible. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I wouldn't know any of it. That's what's wrong with our world. 
That's what's wrong with our world. Nobody's opening this. Nobody's reading this. Look at me. Not many are preaching this. Churches are shutting down. Nobody wants to preach this. Everything we know about heaven, about hell, about Jesus Christ, about the Holy Spirit, about God, about angels, about, about, about the lack of the reality of purgatory, amen. The lack, it's not, it's not in here. It's not in here about women preachers. It's not in here about women deacons. It's not in here about disqualified this and that. That is in here. Everything we know about Israel, everything we know about them being the apple of God's eye, everything we know about the tribulation period, everything we know about the millennial kingdom, everything we know about the King of kings and the Lord of lords, everything we know about a place called Calvary, thank God for a place called Calvary, only mentioned one time in our Bible, but one time is good enough for me. And when they were come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified. Crucified him. I wouldn't have known about Calvary. I wouldn't have known about a crucifixion. I wouldn't have known about a redeemer. I wouldn't know about shed blood. But thank God for the revelation of God's word. Hallelujah. Kiss that Bible. Kiss the sun lest to be angry. Kiss that Bible, friend. My life, my life, my life, my life is so much better off. Because of the revelation of God's word. So much better off. Amen. They're fixing to go war. And then come a rider stirring up some dust on the hillside. And somebody probably said, Rider coming in. How could they tell the dust cloud? Hold off, rider coming in. Can't quite tell who it is yet. Got closer, got off his mount. I'd like to see King Ahab. He's right over there. Brushed off the dust. Somebody said, will y'all get that horse some water or that mule? Sure. King Ahab, I'm a man of God. I just want to tell you before you go fight. That crowd you're fixing to go fight, they said that your gods are only gods of the hills, but not God of the valleys. But I'm basically here to tell you that the God on the mountain is the same God in the valley. And there's fixing to be some real tail stomping, and you're the ones fixing to do it. Ain't God good? What valley are you in, friend? Come on to the instruments. What valley are you in? What valley are you walking through? What valley are you traversing? What storm are you facing? What, what valley is your family in? What valley are you in personally? What valley are you in personally? Please look at the preacher. I'm almost done. What valley have you been in for a while? Could I tell you one more time? One more time. The God on the mountain. The God on the mountain. I promise you, he's the God of the valley. He'll help you. He'll help you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word. Thank you for this great Old Testament story. Thank you for theology, the unity of the Godhead, the sovereignty of God, the immutability of our God, and the omnipresence of our God. Surely you'd be down that valley as well, and you were. You already were before they ever got there. Help us to grasp these truths. Encourage your church. Encourage your people. Bless as we sing in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Page 3.